Thank you so much, Amy, and, and thanks all of you, and thanks all of you relatives for coming now. <laughs> Stacking the audience and, and helping uh, me make a uh, make a trip to Little Rock has been a long time. Uh, so I'm here today to talk about a subject that probably doesn't get mentioned very often in a public policy school. I spent a lot of years in public policy, kind of related work, and I didn't hear a lot about glamour. <laughs> um, um, but. I, what I want to convince you today is, first of all, that glamour is much bigger than we usually think. It's more important than we usually give it credit. And also to do what I call decode it. It's how I'll help talk about how exactly does it work, what are the sort of elements. So when you go to write a book about glamour or think about glamour, you're immediately confronted with a very basic question, which is, what the heck is it? Um, a lot of people sort of start with the idea, well, glamour is just another word for fashion. Well, that's not quite right. That's too narrow. What about Hollywood movies? Oh, it's fashion and celebrity. Now, you start adding things. People think glamour is a specific style. Glamour is having sequins like Miss Amy here. <laughs> She's very glamorous. Uh, no, but when you start to think about it, in fact, you quickly start to realize that even if we think about glamour in a very stereotypical way, very narrow way, we it comes in different forms. There's the glamour of travel, but then even within the glamour of travel, there's the glamour of the beach and the glamour of the big city, the glamour of Paris and the glamour of the Aspen and the ski resort. I mean, what very different sorts of things seem to be glamorous. And so when I started to work on the issue of glamour, I, I had to first tackle this issue of what is it? What kind of thing is it? And I came to the conclusion that glamour is what I call nonverbal persuasion. It's a kind of rhetoric or communication that deals less in words than in pictures. They may be word pictures, but there's always something in our minds. And that glamour, this was my big epiphany moment, glamour is, it's like humor. Humor, how do we know that there's humor? How do we know that something is funny? We don't write down someone must slip on a banana peel or someone must make a play on words. There's all different kinds of humor and there are things that are very funny in a particular time and place or to a particular person that are not funny at all in a different time and place or to a different person and sometimes I mean, this is one reason that when Hollywood makes these big tentpole movies, as they're called, that are supposed to sell internationally, they tend to be action movies as opposed to romantic comedies. Because a romantic comedy, it's very much about the words and the people doesn't travel as well. So glamour is similar. There's something glamorous and there's an audience. And the way you decide whether there really is glamour there is by how that audience responds. There's a distinct emotional reaction, projection and longing, if only. If only life could be like that. If only I could drive that car. If only I could date that woman. If only I could be that woman. If only I could wear those shoes. If only I could be on that beach, you know, whatever. If only I could elect that president, whatever it might be life would be the way I want it to be. That there's this sort of sense of your ideal becoming real. So it's, it's very much, you know, the Emerald City shining in the distance. So I have a couple of pictures from my book. That these, are, these are pictures, not glamorous pictures, but pictures of glamour happening. So we have this Norman Rockwell picture with the little girl looking at the movie star magazine on her, her lap and thinking, oh, if only I could you know, be beautiful like that, and, and probably a little bit of if only I could be grown up you know, as well. Uh, I, we talk about it. Another thing I write in the book is about you know, princess glamour, which is uh, you know, the, the four-year-old who wants to be a princess is 
you know, it's, a, it's controversial these days, but it's partly about being grown up and being beautiful and having those ideas. Um, and here's another picture of glamour at work. And this is actually the one that I relate to as a child. I actually wrote about this this week. I write for Bloomberg View, and I have something that talks about my, my favorite book in kindergarten was You Will Go to the Moon. And, and with The Wizard of Oz, looking at it through this lens, I think that was my first experience of glamour, was The Wizard of Oz and You Will Go to the Moon. And in the 60s, when I was little, and when probably when this picture was taken, the space race was incredibly glamorous, and the idea of the future, and, and this was this kind of longing for that, you know, whatever that meant to us, the, the, the wonderful world to come. We often associate glamour with consumer purchases, particularly by women. Uh, Buy me, ladies, said the dress, and I will make you into a beautiful and whole and complete human being. That's glamour. Do not be silly, said the man, for a dress alone cannot do that. True, said the lady, I will have the shoes and the bag as well. <laughs> Which is wonderful, you know, one, we enjoy it, but we know it's silly, but we're still susceptible to it, the glamour, if only these shoes will change your life. And of course, this is only something that women are susceptible to. No man ever bought a pair of shoes because, oh, I don't know, he wanted to be Michael Jordan or LeBron James. You know, <laughs> you know this, is, this is something that, you know, we all get taken carried away a little bit. It, it, it takes us out of the moment, puts us into our ideal self, our ideal life. Glamour is used all the time in things that are about houses, real estate ads, interiors magazines. Uh, this picture is from, uh, uh, I think it was Bloomingdale's, but one of the department stores advertising the linens on the bed. And why is that so, so, why does glamour work so well for that particular type of environment? Because it allows you to imagine life would be perfect if I lived in that house. This is a wonderful book, by the way, by another LA writer, very funny book uh, by Megan Dom. And it's about, you know, she is very susceptible to this. Every ad she sees for a house, she thinks, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if she likes her house or not. Oh, I, that would be the life for me. You know, it's, glamour is about this picturing a different, better self in different, better circumstances, sort of a picture of your ideal life. And that may be embodied in a car, it might be embodied in the space program, it might be embodied in a dress, or it might be, you know, in a house, in an ideal kitchen, some kind that links you to the self you'd like to be. So one of the points that I develop you know, quite a bit in the book and I've thought a lot about is the idea that glamour is different for different audiences in different circumstances. And here are a couple of examples. This is probably you know, sort of the epitome of mid 20th century feminine indulgence, a glamorous photo of this woman in uh, a, a silver fox coat. And this was actually by a photographer named Virginia Thorin, who's still alive, who specialized in taking pictures, glamorous pictures of ladies in furs. She worked for the trade association of the furriers. And every month they would have these fabulous looking ads in the fashion magazines. And I always say it's like, instead of got milk, it was like got mink. But um, this was, and this is one of her examples. Well, why, if we think of glamour as something that appeals to what you wish you had but you don't, that sort of ideal you would like to have, why is this so, not just beautiful but glamorous in that particular uh, cultural context? Well, first of all, we're dealing with a society where people it's, it's an upwardly mobile society. People didn't have money. They lived through, this is, this is appealing to people who lived through the Depression, that lived through the war. And now, well, she has that big fur coat. And her, obviously, her, she didn't buy it for herself. Her husband bought it for her. He must really love her. Or maybe he's guilty, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with he, he must really love her. And 
he's doing mighty well for himself. <laughs> they're, they're on the way up. You know, she's arrived. And we see this same kind of glamour today uh, more in sort of the, in versions of hip-hop glamour. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's a kind of, to put the pejorative on it, conspicuous consumption, which I think is kind of unfair. But it's a, it's a kind of enjoying luxury, not only for the luxury itself, and it is a beautiful coat, it is soft, it is enjoyable, but also for what it represents, for the, the achievement it represents, the respect, the other people who see it accord you, those sorts of things. Um, and this is glamorous to people who actually, you know, wish they had the coat, M might some of them be moved to, to buy it or, or to, you know, to cut out that ad and <laughs> leave it on the breakfast table or something. Uh, and, and that is sort of mid-20th century glamour picturing feminine indulgence. I would argue that this is the 21st century version. Here we see something, probably she bought it for herself. <laughs> these, and you see these pictures everywhere, <laughs> the, 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 the hot stone massage. Because what does this audience want that they don't have? They want to be pampered. They want to escape. We'll hear that word a lot in a little bit. Escape is a major component of glamour. They want to get away from the hectic world where they've got a million demands on their time and just feel relaxed. It's a different sort of glamour. It's not about other people admiring you. It's about maybe other people pampering you. But it's a, it's a different sort of fantasy. So the title of my book is The Power of Glamour. And one of the big arguments in the book is that glamour is powerful. Glamour is influential. Glamour is important. And I start by telling the story of Michaela de Prince, who's the ballerina in this photo. Uh, when, when Michaela de Prince was four years old, she was living in the most horrible circumstances. She was living in an orphanage in a, in a refugee camp in Sierra Leone. And she was in the orphanage because her father had been murdered during the Civil War and her mother had died of starvation. So it's really, you know, a horrible circumstance. And as if that weren't bad enough, of all the little orphans in the orphanage, she was treated the worst. They called her a devil child. They said no one would ever want to adopt her because instead of being, you know, adorable, perfect skin little four-year-old with a perfectly smooth brown skin, she had these white splotches on her skin. And she was a little rebellious and didn't always do what she was told. She was the devil child. So they treated her really badly. So she's in this horrible circumstance to begin with. And then of all the people in the horrible circumstances, she's the worse off. So one day from who knows where, a Western dance magazine blows against the fence surrounding the, the orphanage. And on the, picture, on the cover is this picture of this beautiful, smiling ballerina in a tutu, just looking like she came from another world. Everything that the little girl's life was not. And she just saw that and she thought, oh, if only. That was what she wanted. That was where she wanted to be. That was who she wanted to be. And she tore it off and kept it. And she had no place to keep things. She had no, you know, she had no things, really. And so she kept it in her underwear. That was her only sort of private place. She didn't have a knapsack or, you know, backpack or anything. And every night she would pull it out and she would look at this picture and she would dream to be like the lady in the picture. And she says, you know, that kept me going, that helped me survive, that helped me, gave me the strength to live another day. Okay, so that is the first power of glamour. This is an extreme version of glamour just takes us out of the moment and lets us enjoy ourselves, gives us pleasure. The other thing is it can change our lives. Um, and in her case, she got lucky not too long after this happened where she got the picture. An American couple came to the orphanage to, do to adopt one of the other little girls and wound up adopting the two of them. And she showed her new mother this 
picture, and she didn't know English, you know, but words, she could communicate with the picture. And as soon as she got back to New Jersey, she began uh, taking dance le lessons. And she says she was very driven because she wanted to be like the lady in the picture. She was kind of a prodigy. I mean, she, it happened that she actually was a good at dancing and she became a professional ballerina when i wrote the book which wasn't all that long ago she was with the uh the dance theater of harlem she's since moved on she has a book coming out actually herself uh, so i saw an interview with her she's now with a european company i forget which one but and that's the other thing that glamour can do it can point us in a direction that in some way shapes our lives and in fact shaping our careers is often what is often one of the ways that glamour plays a role in our lives I'm of a certain age and, and I'm a journalist of my generation I'm not one of them but many of them were inspired to go into journalism because of Woodward and Bernstein not necessarily the real Woodward and Bernstein uh, in some cases yes but the idea of Woodward and Bernstein as portrayed uh, by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman more recently in the 2000s uh, forensic science programs in different colleges started to notice what they called a CSI effect which was many more students coming uh, to to their programs because they had seen these shows and gotten this sort of glamorous view of, of that profession you know uh, fashion uh, fashion departments have the project runway effect Pro there's always been a kind of glamour pulling people into fashion but there was an anticipation of this um, glamour has moved men and today women but has moved men to join the military since the days of Achilles um, it's the it's the oldest form of glamour I talk and in fact when the word the word glamour originally was a originally meant a literal magic spell you cast a glamour on someone and they saw something that wasn't there in the 19th century it gradually became metaphorical and one of the w first ways it was used, the way we use it today in this metaphorical sense, was to refer to the glamour of battle. Because men were inspired to m the military by the idea, the glamorous ideas that are contained in, in, the, in the, the glamour battle. The ideas of camaraderie, of courage, of you know, me giving meaning to your life, patriotic significance, serving your country, heroism, there's a whole cluster of glamorous ideas. And although um, people are constantly trying to take the glamour off of battle, and especially after World War I, there was a lot of use of that term in that negative way, we still see glamour used in military recruiting ads. And it's very interesting that the US Marines, who of all the branches of the service, you would think would be the least glamorous in many ways. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're hitting the beaches, they're down in the dirt. If they're not the Air Force, you know, the glamour of the aviator, another early 20th century glamour. And yet with the few, the proud, you know, the Marines, this is a very glamorous idea. You want to be, you know, obviously it doesn't work on everyone, but they don't need to reach everyone. They need to reach the kind of person who make a good Marine. And that guy, you know, you want to be that guy for if, if, you're, if you're, you know, susceptible to that glamour. Another, I did a radio interview recently and somebody brought up something that I thought I really should include, especially for this group, uh, which is the number of people who got a glamorous idea of working in the White House from the West Wing. Now, you know, people always had the idea that you could be president or you could be a senator or you could be secretary of state, but these behind the scenes, all the staff, you know, that was not, that was not a glamorous thing to work you know, have one of the, you know, be the advance man or even be the press secretary. This was not the kind of a glamorous idea. And, you know, I've been told that people are flocking to Washington and particularly in earlier, you know, this is, you know, this show's been off the air for a while. Uh, but it has inspired people to pursue those kinds of, of, of political careers that are not the obvious ones because that, of that glamorous vision. So, 2008, glamour is actually pretty rare in politics, and it's very rare among politicians because, as we'll talk about, you need mystery to have glamour. 
and it's unusual to have a politician, particularly at the presidential level, who can maintain that air of mystery. There always has to be some, some distance. But in 2008, Barack Obama was, I used to say, because I was starting my book project, and he was like God's gift to my glamour project. Because, you know, people might have trouble picturing a glamorous movie star. I mean, I can, I can convince you certain movie stars are glamorous, but it's not like, you know, 1935 or something where they're all glamorous. But boy, this guy was glamorous. He was, it wasn't just that he was young and handsome and, you know, that, sort of, that was good, but he was, you know, he was new to the scene, so he had that kind of mystery. He had this slightly exotic background, um, and he, for his supporters, came to represent whatever it was that they wanted in a president, in a country, in a world, and poor Hillary, <laughs> she didn't know what hit her. Um, but uh, th this was, you know, this was a, a really unusual phenomenon in American politics or in politics in general to have a candidate who was this glamorous to the supporters. Now, that helped him a lot as a candidate. However, it is glamour is a much better thing in a campaign than it is once you get elected president. When you're elected president, what you really need is charisma. Um, and all politicians have some, but you need, you know, the more you have, the better off you are. And I discuss this at length, but the, the, the point I want to make here is glamour is about projection. Going back to it, it's about what's in the audience's mind. And different people who saw different things in candidate Barack Obama 2008, and they saw contradictory things and in some cases they saw impossible things things that were so ideal you know we're gonna have a world with we're gonna suddenly get over all our political divisions um, that you know a real president cannot possibly live up to this uh, you know whether you like him or not and of course he got reelected he it doesn't mean it's a disaster it just means he becomes a more regular politician after that. People vote for him the second go round because they like him better than the other guy, less because he embodies all their hopes and dreams. But that was, as I say, a relatively rare example of, of glamour in politics. Um, in, in general, when glamour has a big effect on our political or cultural ideas, it's not vis-a-vis -vis an individual, it's vis-a-vis -vis ideas. So in the early 20th century, we get glamorous images that tell us what it means to be modern. We start to see, you know, this is what the world of the future will be. These are the highways of the future. We'll build these future, uh, future uh, interstates. This is from a Disney thing called Magic, uh, Magic Highway. What is a modern woman? What is this idea that we keep hearing about? What does that mean? Uh, there are all kinds of glamorous images, whether they're Hollywood images or advertising images, all the way up into the 70s, with some of you probably remember the Charlie uh, ads, you know, capturing this idea of what is a modern woman. Oh, and we zapped, you it must be on an animation that it's not supposed to be. Today, I, you know, we, I talked about the space age and the glamour of when I was a little kid. It was all about the rocket ships. Well, today, if you want to make a glamorous image of the technological future, put some windmills on it. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're selling cars or you're selling beauty products or sketch pads. Windmills will make it more glamorous. <laughs> Econ books. Verizon, not a company, I think. And most of all, it will make your business school glamorous. Every business school has to have some windmills. This is Northwestern, Kellogg School. This is the Sloan School. And this is not a business school, but a business. This is Goldman Sachs. You want to associate yourself with progress and technology and the green future, you know, put some windmills on it. It's, it's a, a, new, a new sort of glamorous image. So I mentioned escape earlier. All forms of glamour, and I hope I've convinced you a little bit, something that I talk about much more in the book, that glamour comes in many different forms and it depends on the audience. 
but all forms of glamour have certain key elements three key elements and the first element is they all contain a promise of escape and transformation they, they hold out some vision of a different better life a different better you a different better country a different better world in different better circumstances and this is why glamour is so good at selling travel and selling fashion because you know you're going to go away from your home to some place you've not been and we can make this very glamorous image of it where you know you're you're looking through it you the arch is inviting you to project yourself you know there's some little shoes there you can imagine putting them on and similarly with fashion fashion glamorous fashion is not the same as clothes or apparel you know when we see glam when we talk about glamour and fashion we're usually talking about things you have no place to wear you know, it's, it's like a different life. In a different life, you will have a reason to wear that dress or, or, or to be with a woman wearing that dress. Uh, you know, it's a different life where, you know, somehow this, this will take you out of your regular life into a special world. And glamour, of course, obscures things, as I'll talk about in a little, a little bit. When we see a photo like this, we feel that sense of projection and longing. We get that sense of, of, of glamour. And it's not because we want to get on an airplane tomorrow. I'm getting on one tomorrow. Because we know if we're actually on the airplane, it's not very glamorous. It's not even very comfortable. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty unpleasant. It does the job. But when we see a photo like that, especially with something up against the moon and the clouds, we don't really identify with passengers cushed in within the airplane. We identify with the plane. It's like you project yourself into the plane, soaring up above and going someplace wonderful. You know, leaving your troubles behind and, and, and go, or, or just your, you know, don't have to be troubles, but, you know, your ordinary life behind and going someplace wonderful. So, Glamour is used a lot in advertising and in sales. This is a famous example from the 1950s. Uh, it was a famous Revlon campaign called Fire and Ice. It was red lipstick and matching nail polish. And, the, and then they recreated it in the 90s. As, then it's kind of retro glamour. But the promise of the Fire and Ice campaign was, you know, this is selling, this is not, this is not a, this is not a silver fox for a coat, okay? This is selling to the average woman in the drugstore who might want a little piece of glamour. And what it's saying to her implicitly is, you know, you're just in your everyday, you know, your, your everyday Clark Kent identity is you are a hardworking housewife or you're a hardworking saleswoman in a department store or you know you could be a maid in a hotel or you could be a school teacher you have a, like an ordinary life but this nail polish this lipstick gives you a little piece of that dream you are really in your heart you are this hot mama in her silver dress you know and it gives you that little connection to the person that you would like to be and the life you would like to have and this again is a, is a mass market example this is not a mass market example and it's not from the 1950s this is recent this is i think from 2011 i believe but this is angelina jolie in an ad for louis vuitton so this is appealing to affluent you know people who have the money to buy very expensive handbags uh, and luggage. Um, and so they are not like the mid 20th century audience. They are very comfortable. And especially, you know, you can sell Louis Vuitton in China, you sell it in a different way. But here, if you show this to people in 1960, say, they would go, Okay, she's pretty, but what is she doing in a swamp, in a beat-up rowboat, wearing her gardening clothes? I mean, it would not make them want to pay thousands of dollars for handbags. Uh, you know, they, they, it wouldn't compute at all. But just as the hot stone massage means something glamorous to today's audience, 
this, particularly for the audience it's intended for, the, the affluent audience, it says something very, it sells what they don't want. It sells tranquility, it sells nature, it sells escape and simplicity. It's away from the sort of buzz of all the things, all the ways they got so affluent, uh, you know. And it also, if you read the, the copy or you just know about Angelina Jolie and why she might be in a Cambodian swamp, um, it also sells ideals of philanthropy and a humanitarianism and family, which are also in our in our time uh, have have got a kind of glamour to them as well. So this is a picture from the most glamorous store in America. It's not Bergdorf's, it's not Tiffany's, it's the container store. <laughs> and again, it's the same idea. <laughs> you go in the container store and you see the, these, you know, these shelves and you think, my life could be organized. <laughs> I could get a grip. I could get everything under control. All I need are those boxes. <laughs> Escape and transformation, <laughs> 21st century style. However, they leave things out. And this brings us to the second element in all forms of glamour, which is grace. I said that glamour originally meant a literal magic spell, and it still contains that sense of magic and illusion. And the illusion is not the promise of escape and transformation, because sometimes that's true. Sometimes, you know, Michaela de Prince really did become a ballerina. That really did happen. That, you know, that, that dream came true. What it leaves out is the effort. Michaela de Prince became a ballerina, not because she saw a picture, but because she worked really, really hard for many, many years. And, and I'm sure had a lot of sore feet and muscles and all those sorts of things that don't show up in the pictures that I show you of her. Glamour conceals effort. It conceals flaws. It conceals difficulties. It conceals the time when you get home with the boxes and still have to sort through your junk. It conceals the mosquitoes that are biting Angelina Jolie. You know, it conceals, you know, it leaves things out. That is the illusion. We often hear the phrase effortless, effortless glamour, or the use of the term effortless in conjunction with the idea of glamour. Effortlessness is something that's a component of glamour. It's also a very glamorous idea. We would like to have an effortless life. And one way that People, people who are glamorous, in particular, have this quality that Baldassare Castiglione called Spresatura. So in the 16th century, he wrote this how-to book for the aspiring, the people who went to the Clinton School of the day, the aspiring courtiers in, 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 uh, uh, in Italy, how to succeed as a courtier. Uh, and one of the things you needed to have, one of the qualities you needed to have was this idea of sfrasatura, which is translated nonchalance. But the idea is you do things that everybody knows are really hard. You're a great horseman. You're great at conversation. You're a great swordsman. You know, who, everybody knows these things are hard because they're trying to do it too. But you make it look easy. Never let them see you sweat, is what I call it. You know, you make it look easy. And glamorous people tend to have this quality of making things look easy. You don't see the effort. Similarly, glamorous, you know, some of the most glamorous products that we have today are, are ones where everything seems simple. Why are our Apple products so glamorous? Well, it's because they solve very complicated problems without letting people know how complicated the problem was. You know, it, ju it just works. In the book, I talk about two different types of grace. I talk about theatrical grace. Theatrical grace is like Fred and Ginger dancing. In the moment, there really is grace. It really is working. But in the movie, they meet each other for the first time in the park and suddenly go into this dance routine and everything is perfectly harmonious and beautiful. Of course, the reality is, yes, they really are dancing beautifully, but there was lots and lots and lots of rehearsal that went into that. And similarly, there's the behind the scenes, the behind the scenes aspect of theatrical grace. So in this, this period, 
in the golden age of Hollywood in these movies, these women like Jean Harlow here, it's in the movie Dinner at Eight, they wore these really tight, sexy dresses. And the dresses were cut on the bias, which gave them a little bit of stretch. But the reason they were so tight and sexy was that they were sewn into the dresses. They were absolutely smooth. And, and this is long before Lycra. And the result is that if, if she were to sit down in a chair here, she would have a big tear of the back. So they had these leaning boards back uh, in between takes so that they could relax uh, and you know study their lines or meet with their director or whatever without ripping their dresses. And that's the sort of, you know, the dress is very glamorous and all the women who are sitting in the, you know, the teenage girls sitting in the audience thinking, oh, I would love to be like that. They're not thinking that that, you know, if they had that dress, they went home and make a dress like that. They better not make it that tight because it won't really work. But when we think about grace now, we tend to think of a different type, which is actually the way you change the picture. So it's, it's not about something that's real in a moment of time. It's about an image. One of the things that I noticed is if you look at images in, you know, glamorous images of interiors, for some reason the, the lamps all seem to run either on batteries or magic. You will never see a cord like in a crate and barrel uh, catalog or, or, or in, a, in, a, uh, you know, in an interiors magazine. And one of the things, one of the reasons for that is that there are interior stylists. And I interview one and they tape the cords under, you know, under the furniture. And that's what's going on in this one, so you can't see that lamp. And the reason I know, even though I don't know anything about how this picture was uh, constructed. I know that the cord was, is actually there but hidden because it didn't require, this is the post Photoshop version where they've not only removed the cord but some other distractions that are a little magical. And we tend to think that this sort of retouching started with Photoshop and there's a lot of attention to it but in fact it's much older. It's as old as photography and before that people made idealized paintings and drawings. This is a, a photo of Joan Crawford that was taken by the great studio age photographer George Harrell. And there's before and there's after six hours in the dark room of retouching. And you know, she's young and pretty in both, but in the original one, she's got this, she's got this, you know, she and the thing that you can't see because of the light in here is she's also completely covered with freckles. She had freckles all over her and never in any of her, the, 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 no fan would have ever realized that. Uh, they were completely taken off um, in the retouching. But even, even photos that are completely candid are just taking a little slice of reality. And so they too can leave things out. This is the most famous paparazzi photo windblown Jackie, Jackie Onassis crossing the street in New York in the 1970s with her perfectly imperfect hair and her little Mona Lisa mysterious smile. And it is very glamorous and much more glamorous after it was cropped. <laughs> you know, even a perfectly imperfect Jackie, you know, she's standing next to an ugly pole and she's got slightly wrinkled pants and you take those things out you create the grace that really makes this work. So the third element that's in all forms of glamour is mystery, which I touched on a little bit when I talked about why it's so rare, glamour is so rare in politicians. And mystery has two functions. It is intriguing, it pulls us in, and it hides things, it enhances grace. Glamour is neither opaque nor, that word we love so much these days, is it transparent. Glamour is translucent. It gives you just enough information to excite your imagination so you can fill things in with your own desires. It doesn't give you too much information, as we say these days. And this is why, you know, sunglasses are glamorous. You see the face, but you don't see the eyes. You just get a hint of them. Or why this, in this, there are a couple of things going on in the opening breakfast at Tiffany's. Audrey Hepburn has her back turned to her, uh, turned to us, so that's intriguing and mysterious and glamorous about her. And also, she's looking into the Tiffany's window, but we can't really see what she sees. We see some chandeliers, but we imagine what she's seeing and what she's imagining. What is her idea of this perfect Tiffany's place? One way to create this sort of mystery and distance is to 
displace things in, in, in geographically, to have some exotic idea of a foreign place. Ralph Lauren's safari collections, he admits, I never went to Africa. And if I had, I probably wouldn't have designed the things that I did. It inspired, the idea of Africa inspired a certain sort of longing. The other thing we can do is displace in time. Mad Men creates, in some ways, a glamorous vision of the past, although it's a little complicated and the com complexity is very well captured in this title card. This is the guy who designed the title card, says the leading man is hero. The silhouette, he looks like he's on top of the world. Um, he's got the cigarette, which was also glamorous in those days. Um, we, as the viewers of the show, know that the glamorous facade that he presents to the world is fake and that he's actually got all, the, all of these hidden vices and hidden demons and all these difficulties. But, but that's displacing in time to the past. You can also displace to the future. One of the theories that I had when I was researching the book is that for its fans, Star Trek was glamorous. And it was glamorous in certain obvious ways in the same way that the glamour of battle is glamorous. Adventure, heroism, camaraderie, exploration. But I actually did a survey, and in the survey I learned a, that all that's true, but there's another thing too. For its fans, Star Trek, or many fans, Star Trek represented a glamorous portrayal of the ideal workplace. It was this great team where everybody contributed and the boss was smart and made good decisions and there wasn't petty rivalries and if somebody was really obnoxious they probably got killed by the end of the show or exiled to another planet or you know and you were doing important work and it was interesting it was just sort of the perfect place to work and that's not something that is about space per se or the future per se that's a desire that you know we all would like to work in the perfect place and, and where we would see it might uh, might be different I mean I don't know that it would be exactly analogous um, but in some ways like scandal <laughs> it has such horrible things in it too but 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 in a way that little team of the gladiators is a is another sort of notion of, of a sort of it's sort of glamour horror, actually, kind of, which is it? And I'll just end with this last image. This is an image uh, taken by Julia Schulman, who took many glamorous images of modern architecture, particularly in Los Angeles. And what I love about this picture is the way he creates mystery in a completely transparent box. And he does that by putting these two young women there, we don't know who they are, we don't know what they're talking about, but we can imagine sort of being in that conversation to what would that life be like? What would it be like to live in that house? And if that doesn't do it for you, you have the lights of Los Angeles stretched below and each of those individual lights is a potential life, a potential alternative, something that could take you away you know, that could be your, your dream, your dream life in the same way that the New York skyline, for example, could do the same thing. So George Harrell, the great photographer, was often asked how he made these glamorous pictures of movie stars. And he said, bring out the best, conceal the worst, and leave something to the imagination, which is a pretty good formula for glamour, but you also need the element that just photographing movie stars adds to it, which is the promise of escape and transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got time for some questions. Was any, would anybody like to ask a question? Surely there's a question on glamour. Well, Aunt Pat has one, and <laughs> I told Virginia it was the roughest part is speaking in front of your family. And <laughs> here you go, Pat. You just really put well, the pressure on. Well, this I know I can ask it later, but I want to, you to say a little bit about, and you quickly referred to the horror that's yeah. another side of glamour. Yeah. You've had an interesting column in Time Magazine about jihad and the glamour behind it. I think that really bears looking yeah, at Yeah, this, this is a great question because it's become even more, I, I'm, I've been thinking about revisiting that subject. Um, people often ask me, and you know, in here I tend to present 
sort of largely positive view. I mean, we see that there's an illusion, but I tell you stories about Michaela de Prince, and you know, that's an inspiring story. And, um, but there is, you know, glamour is neither good nor bad. It's just a form of rhetoric. It's just a form of communication, and it can be used for evil purposes as well as for good purposes. And then sometimes you can also get in trouble if you forget what's left out. And one of the things that you know I'm very conscious of and that I did write about and with the rise of ISIS has become even more uh, prevalent, uh, prominent is the way that f for these young jihadi terrorists, the idea of being a jihadi terrorist is very glamorous. And it, it weds two of the most ancient forms of glamour. It weds that glamour of battle, which, as I say, goes back to, you know, Achilles, at least, with a kind of religious glamour, too. You know, you could be not just a great warrior, but a holy warrior. And this is very inspiring for a certain type of primarily young man, although we're starting to see young women as well. And I really think, I mean, you know, this is far from my expertise. I am, you know, a domestic person. You know, I don't know about these foreign conflicts that much. But I really do feel that people who are working on these issues and working on these issues of counterterrorism really need to think about glamour and think about the ways that you uh, puncture that glamour, or puncture glamour in general. And the ways you puncture glamour in general, one is you just show the facts, which are grubbier, you know, you'll go off from your, you know, you're an embittered uh, young man in England and you're going to go off to, uh, you know, to fight and for the Islamic State, well, it's not going to be as exciting as you think and you're going to be killing other Muslims and, and there's that. So that that's the sort of the facts, that may, that may be a way to diffuse it. Another way is to create horror, you know, to um, that probably doesn't work on this audience. Another way, which is tricky, you really have to understand the audience, but is to use humor. That is to make things seem ridiculous. You know, to it, it, like you think it's great, but it's not. Um, and and that's 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 also very tricky for the same reasons that glamour is tricky. You have to know the audience. But yes, definitely, there is definitely a potential dark side to glamour. It can be used for bad purposes. And the other thing is, and much more often. It, you know, glamour can only point you in a direction, even if it's for a good thing. You have to, if you're actually going to act on it, as opposed to just enjoy it in your mind as a momentary escape, you have to edit back in all those things that are left out. So you, you know, you see the glamorous picture of the, the, the future magic highways of the future. Well, you've got to think about, you know, where are they really going to go and how much are they really going to cost and are they, are they going to be used and if they're used a lot is there going to be traffic and if they're not used a lot are they going to be worth the money and a lot of a lot of infrastructure problems there's this this uh, projects there's this tension between you know the glamorous picture which makes it look like nobody will use it because that then it looks effortless and the 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 numbers you need to show to make it look like it will pay off uh, which can be uh, you know budged in another direction so there's a tension there well, let me just say that uh, I learned a lot about glamour today. <laughs> Bet you hadn't thought about it that I, that I had Number one, that I had never thought about. Uh, and even the last question is something that I really now am going to have to think more about. Let's, uh, let's give Virginia a really round of applause and come by and visit, buy her book and visit with her. Thank you.